Well, several years ago, when we were living in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, I had a friend that I would go to lunch with every once in a while. He was on staff at the church where I was serving, and he was our, he was our pastoral care, our congregational care pastor, much like Pastor Dewey is here. He was a man that was in his, in his upper 70s. He was actually the father of our lead pastor, and uh, we used to call him Pastor Dad. It was fun. We call him P. Diddy. I don't know if you know what that means, but uh, Pastor Dad. And uh, I had a lot of fun with him, and I loved just we, every once in a while, every couple of weeks, he and I would just go to lunch together, and, and my favorite place in, in the world, and it was, it was back when... Chick-fil-A was still kind of new. Back, back in the day when they used to take coupons from any time period, that was like my, really my favorite. Like I had one that was like, this is five years old, will they still take it? Oh yeah. It's like, that's why I love Chick-fil-A. Anyway, so, so I would ask Pastor Dad, and his name was actually Harold McKellips, and I asked Harold McKellips if, if, he would, uh, if we could go to lunch, and we'd get in the car, and, and I'd be so excited. He'd say, where do you want to go to lunch today, Aaron? And I'd be like, well, Harold, do you want to go anywhere? And he's like, I don't really have any, you know, favorites, but I know you do. And I'd be like, let's go to Chick-fil-A. And so we go to Chick-fil-A and we get in there and I can still see it in my mind. We sit down and, and I ordered the Chick-fil-A sandwich because I love Chick-fil-A sandwiches. And, and I'd sit down and I'd say, and I'd take a bite. Mm, I could just still taste it. He's sitting across from me. I say, Harold, I love Chick-fil-A sandwiches. And in a very straight face, he goes, Aaron, you love people. You like Chick-fil-A sandwiches. <laughs> I'll never forget that phrase. In fact, we use that phrase in our house uh, sometimes because there are special meals that, that our kids really, really, really like. And they can't help it. They're like, I love pizza. And I'd be like, Landon, you, you like pizza. You love people. But Harold McKellips, he, Harold passed away last year and. I, I, called his, I called his son, my, my friend, who's district superintendent in, in Oklahoma now, and, and I just I reminded him of that, that phrase. You like people, or you love people, you like food. A reminder of where priorities are, right? We have a love-hate relationship with food, don't we? I mean, if you, if you look into our culture and all the things that we have on TV, the, the food network, there's a, a television station dedicated to food, right? We have people called foodies. You ever heard of a foodie, right? We have a special restaurant of every kind of meal. Like, I've been to places where they just do cupcakes. Awesome. Or one of my favorites around here, Amelie's. Anybody been to Amelie's? The other day I was in Amelie's, and I was like, I'll take one of those, and one of those, and one of those, and one of those. Thankfully, that was just in my head. I didn't say it out loud. I just got a coffee. But those pastries, right? We love to eat. And, and if, if you think about it, you know, I am suddenly realizing I don't have my glasses on. That's all right. I'm just going to get a little closer to this, and it'll be just fine. We love to eat, and not only do we love to eat, if you think about it, we even plan our whole schedules, the schedule of our lives around eating, right? We just do. It's normal. It, eating is a natural part of life. Eating is a necessity of life, and even enjoying eating is not bad, I, I, I love the fact that there are examples in scriptures of Jesus, you know, he, he would be invited to, to meals and feasts and parties and Jesus would go and he'd hang out with people. And in fact, it was so, he had such a reputation that even some of the religious leaders didn't think he fit into their little mold, into their little box of what a, what a true religious leader should look like. And they would call him a glutton and a drunkard. They would call Jesus that. They would say things about him and his disciples. And there's even this way, if you think about it, and we receive it at the end of all of our gatherings, the invitation to the table where Jesus talks about the bread and he talks about the wine or the juice for us. 
but see what happens. The question is, what happens when our attitude and how we approach this natural, normal necessity of life becomes an obsession, an obsession that keeps us from loving God with everything in us? Or what happens when this normal necessity becomes something that even keeps us from accepting the unconditional love that God has for us? We're gonna be spending some time today talking about that killer sin, that deadly sin called gluttony. And right at the top, I I want to say a few things here before we jump into this too far. Eating disorders are real. There are health needs related to the subject. And we learn more and more about how we are made up, chemicals in our brains, genes we are born with. And so what we'll be talking about today has a spiritual aspect, but there are some of us who may have health concerns that we can find help for. And so I want to remind you, if this is something maybe you're struggling with in that kind of way, you are not alone. You matter and there is hope. We've been talking about these seven deadly sins, these killer sins, and and really there's not such a a list like this that you will find in the Bible where it's just laid out in seven different different sins. But this list was come up with by, it came up with by some early Christians, and some of them were desert monks who had gone away into the desert to spend time and to, to, to focus their lives on God and try to, try to live in such a way where there were no distractions, nothing that, that kept them from, from really centering their lives around, around God, to being able to hear the voice of Jesus. So one of the sins that made it to the top of their list was this sin of gluttony. And it would make a lot of sense if you think about it. They're a long way from everybody. They're a long way from food. And so they wrestle with this hunger that they have and trying to figure out how to deal with their hunger and not allow that hunger that they have to get in the way of hearing from God. And so that's probably why gluttony has has made it onto the list. See, Gluttony is a sin that is committed when we feed the hunger of our souls with anything other than the fulfilling satisfaction of God's love. That's really what gluttony is about. So don't check out if you don't have a problem with food or anything like that. It's not just about food. I want you to hear. See, listen to this. Gluttony has more to do with being consumed by what we consume than it does the side effects of our consumption. More to do with being consumed by what we consume, right? Think about that for a minute. What is something that is consuming you? What in your life right now is consuming you? It doesn't have to be food. It can be anything in your life that is controlling you instead of you controlling it. Anything in your life that is controlling you instead of you controlling it. This is not about our outward appearance. It has everything to do with what feeds the hunger within our inner lives. The hunger for acceptance. The hunger to be known. The hunger for security. The hunger for peace. The hunger for hope. The hunger for love. The hunger for identity and stability. The hunger for contentment. If I can just have a little more, I'll be happy. 
the hunger for happiness. What we're really talking about is taking these, the, a non-spiritual substance in our life and trying to feed the spiritual hunger within us. See, all those things that we are hungering for really are spiritual. And we try to feed the hunger. We, we try to feed it with sex, with food. We, we, we'll try to, and, and, and when we try to feed it with sex, we'll be talking about that in a few, few weeks. We try to feed this hunger with money or materialism or status, and we'll talk about that next week. We try to feed this hunger with all kinds of temporary fixes. But it's interesting because of all these sins on this killer sins list, these seven deadly sins, gluttony seems like the least likely to be one. Except that it's really more about whether we are turning to God to feed our spiritual hunger or we're turning to something else, right? What we feed our spiritual hunger determines the type of life we live. Hear what I'm saying? What we feed the spiritual hunger determines the type of life we live. Jesus experiences this in a time in the desert. In the book of Matthew chapter four, we're gonna look here for a moment about this experience that Jesus has. Right before Jesus begins his incredible ministry, Jesus is led into the wilderness, the desert by the Holy Spirit. And he spends 40 days and 40 nights praying, just like those, those, uh, those monks in the desert who came up with this list. Jesus has gone to the desert. He's, he's alone in the desert by himself. He is praying. He is fasting. He's not eating. And as the time goes on, he gets tired. He gets exhausted. And you can only imagine the type of hunger he's experiencing. And in chapter four of the book of Matthew in the New Testament, verse three, in the midst of his hunger, in the midst of his exhaustion, Jesus encounters the devil. It says, during that time, the devil came and said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. If you are the son of God. Think about that, right? Like, I mean, think about all that Jesus could do and all that he could do. He, he is God, right? Of course he could turn those stones into bread. Think about all the things he could do with that bread that he makes. Think about all the stones there are in the world. If Jesus wanted to turn it all into bread, nobody would ever be hungry again, right? And of all the people who has a right to do it because he is God, because he has the power to do it, it's Jesus, but do you notice that word, if, that the devil uses? He's slick, man. <laughs> what a thought to put into Jesus' mind. If you really are. What's, what's the devil getting at? Well, if you go back a little bit before this, before the 40 days and the 40 nights, there's another encounter at the end of chapter three in the book of Matthew that Jesus has. Jesus is baptized and, and as he's baptized and he comes out of the water, there's another voice that speaks to Jesus. You know what that voice says to him? It's the voice of God. He says, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great, what? Joy. These are the words from God the Father, God the creator of all things of the whole world. And these are the only words that give us a life-sustaining hope for every day. To face every circumstance, to face even the most uncertain world. These are the words that give Jesus the spiritual food that he needs to respond to the devil. 
after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating, of being tired, of praying and seeking God. Jesus' understanding of God's love for him reminds him of how God is the only one who can satisfy this hunger in our lives. And Jesus responds to the devil, right? Because Jesus recalls the way, the way that God, the God of, of all of the world, the, the God of all creation has led the people of Israel out of slavery. This is the story of the people of Israel. He leads them out of slavery. They're in the desert. He, he takes them through the, and, and, and he provides food for them, right? Do you know that story? When they are filled with hunger and exhaustion and fear, God provided for the people of Israel back in that old story at the beginning of the Old Testament. He provided for them this thing called manna which is a bread-like substance. Jesus knows that story. Jesus knows that God, that same God who led the people of Israel to freedom is the same God who says to Jesus, you are my dearly loved son. Jesus knows this, right? Jesus knows this as he's going through those 40 days and 40 nights. I wonder what his prayer life was like. I wonder what he kept saying over and over again. What does it mean to be your dearly loved son? What do you want me to do? And they go back and forth. And all of a sudden, he comes face to face with the devil. And the devil tries to get into his mind. He tries to push the voice of God out. He tries to get Jesus to forget what God has said to him, what this God has done. And he tempts him. He tempts Jesus to, instead of feeding the hunger that he has with the identity that God has given him, the devil wants him to exchange it. If you really are the son of God. Jesus responds. He says, no. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, the word that came from the mouth of God to Jesus before this moment of temptation, before the moment when Jesus is tempted to to be driven by his hunger and his exhaustion, what God had said about him was enough to nourish him, right? What God had said about him was enough to nourish him and to give him a strength to overcome the temptation to forget who he was. You are my dearly loved son. I think it's interesting when we we read these words from Jesus, these words that are talking about hunger or, or talking about when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, there's a line in that prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Many of us maybe have memorized it and we we say, give us this day our daily bread, right? Well, the version that I, I'm using it says It says this, give us today the food we need. This prayer that Jesus is preaching, he's he's not just talking about spiritual food. He's teaching people. Think about the people who are first hearing these words, first hearing this prayer that Jesus wants them to pray, most of whom may not be very sure where their food will come from that day, right? Right? And he's teaching them to pray with a dependence on God to not only meet their physical need of food, but also the hunger within them. Sometimes I wonder, and this is for my own life, maybe because I don't really know what it's like to be hungry physically, Maybe sometimes I have a difficult time realizing my spiritual hunger. Maybe that's why Jesus was practicing fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Not as a way to to diet and lose weight, but to drive home the incredibly deep dependence upon what it means to be the dearly loved 
one of God. See, there's lots of, there's lots of fasting diet plans out there, right? Anybody heard of any of those? <laughs> And there's lots of calorie counting plans. In fact, every once in a while, I try it. I don't know why I do it, but every once in a while, I try the calorie counting plan. And, um, and it doesn't go very well. Because everybody around me gets really annoyed. Because I always try to get, no, save the labels, save the labels. I've got to count the calories. Or it's no fun to go to the restaurant because you sit down and you're like, can I eat that? Can I eat that? And that's all I'm thinking about. In fact, one time Becky and I went on a date night and I've been working so hard at counting these calories. Oh, I've been doing really good. And I wanted to be ready because I wanted to have a good dinner and it was going to be so much fun. And so I, I just, I went out and I ate and then I counted the calories afterwards <laughs> and I was really discouraged. And so from that point on, the rest of the evening, that's all I could think about. In fact, we had to walk around the lake a few more times so I could feel a little better. But it consumed me. It consumed my mind. Consumed me. It comes back to this Obsession. It comes back to how quickly our moods and our outlooks are affected when we obsess. How quickly even our relationships can be impacted. See, really, these are all just, they're symptoms. They're symptoms of more than just our physical hunger they come back to this hunger within. See, it is the spiritual hunger within us that is driving our obsession to be satisfied. A spiritual hunger within us is driving our obsession to be satisfied. See, there will never be enough food to satisfy our spiritual hunger. There will never be enough dieting to satisfy our spiritual hunger. There will never be enough shopping to satisfy our spiritual hunger. I was, I was watching a documentary a couple of weeks ago. Really interesting. It, was, it started back in 2019. Anybody remember that year? 2019. And, and uh, this filmmaker was, was shooting a, a, a film that was about selfies in America and how we, we live by the selfies. <laughs> and so she was traveling across the country and, and she started in September of 2019 and, and as she went along, she, she finally got, it was, it, was, it was the Friday after Thanksgiving in November and she stopped in this little town and, and you know what that Friday is, right? It is Black Friday. <laughs> And so she got up really early and she went to a local Walmart in that town and she waited and watched as people came and the lines formed and and she found this guy who was getting out of his car and she she decided to interview him and she says, why are you here? What, do you need something? He's like, oh, I don't really need anything. He goes, but it's like it fills a void just to go and, and get stuff. Fill a void. Somebody actually admitted that, Right? There'll never be enough. There'll never be enough. I, um, I can even see it in my kids and in my own family sometimes. This need. I need a cell phone, Dad. I need the latest this. I need the latest that. And it's like, they becomes, becomes consumed by it. It really comes back to trying to satisfy a hunger that is never, never ever satisfied with temporary food. In John chapter six in the New Testament, Jesus deals with this deep hunger that we have. 
There's this moment after Jesus has fed the five to 10,000 people. What an incredible story, right? And you know that story? He, he blesses the, the loaves and the fish and he just has a little bit and it turns into, it turns into baskets loads, like an abundant amount of food that Jesus ends up with. And then he leaves that crowd and, and he goes with his disciples and they go out on, on, the, on the lake and, and it, there's this moment where Jesus walks on water. It's just incredible miracle. And they're trying to get away from the crowds a little bit, but the crowds follow them and they make it to another side of the lake on the shore and the crowds catch up with them. Again, this is after a few miracles, big, big miracles where Jesus has fed them. Listen to what happens. This is chapter 6, verse 25 through 33. It says, they found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants you to do. This one's from you. Believe in the one he has sent. And they answered, Show us miraculous, a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them the bread from heaven to eat. Show us a miraculous sign. Show us what you can do, Jesus. I think it's really interesting that they asked that right then. Like after he just fed them basket loads of food, he already did some pretty miraculous things, right? But it wasn't enough. So Jesus has an answer for him. He says, I tell you the truth, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus says, remember who actually fed you in the desert. Remember who satisfied your hunger when you thought you were going to die. It wasn't Moses. Moses was just the messenger. But this time, God is offering you something way more substantial than that manna. God is offering you an opportunity to meet the deepest need of your human existence. And our deepest need is to know the healing, life-changing love that God has for us. A love that is embodied in the very person of Jesus Christ. Listen, Jesus is the visible representation of what God's love for you, for you, for me, looks like. Jesus is proof that you are dearly loved by God. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy the hunger of your soul. So if, if we are gonna, if we're gonna be consumed by something, if we're gonna be consumed by something, maybe we should try being consumed by Jesus. Maybe we need to consume Jesus. Amen. See, imagine, imagine what it would look like When it comes to all these temptations, these temptations to, to fill the void in our lives with food or anything else, if we would turn our attention, turn our eyes, turn our lives toward Jesus. Imagine what it could look like to always remember only God and people 
should receive our love. You like food, Aaron. You love people. Priorities. The Apostle Paul, and we're gonna, we're gonna close with this scripture today. In Philippians chapter three, verse 17 through 21, it says this. It's not gonna be on the screen, so you're just gonna have to listen to the words. Dear brothers and sisters, this is Paul talking, pattern your life after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I've told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Listen, their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior, and he will take our weak, mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. Mm. But we are citizens of heaven. We recognize. Sometimes we need to be reminded. Because we're tempted to, right? Like, we're tempted like everybody. To try to feed the hunger within us with the temporary fixes. It's not about, it's not just about food. It's about paying attention because we are consumed by what we consume. Let's stand together. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes if you're watching online? I just want to ask you a few questions as we move into a time of reflection. What are you consuming? What are you consuming? And what is consuming you? Do you recognize the deep hunger within? The hunger for hope, the hunger for peace, the hunger for love, the hunger for acceptance, the hunger for contentment and happiness. I want to tell you something, there's only one there's only one who can feed that kind of hunger. And his name is Jesus. Hear the voice of God say to you, you are my dearly loved son. You are my dearly loved daughter. We're gonna sing this song together. And as we do, I want, you to, I want you to reflect. If you wanna come and pray at the, these pads, these, these kneeling pads are like altars. If you wanna come and pray there and socially distance there, if you wanna pray and kneel at your chair or sit at your chair, whatever you need to do, but let's sing this together or listen to the words together to remind you, to remind you, to remind us of who we are.